Yeah, give it up for yourselves for being here tonight. You know you're here for the first live from NYPL of 2024, so very good job. Well done. How's everybody doing tonight? All right. I mean, really, that's it? I know it's a library, but you are allowed to yell right now if you want to. You, you're all right? Okay. That was better. We'll work on it through the night. Um, my name is Aiden Flax-Clark. I work here at the library. I put together these events uh, with our team of Live from NYPL, so it is an absolute thrill to see all of your beautiful faces here tonight. Um, we also want to thank the many, many people who are watching online, um, so hello. Um, what a better way to kick things off than with our guest tonight, Heather Cox Richardson, right? How many people are... Yeah. How many people uh, came to rely on watching her videos during the pandemic? A lot. How, how many of you are among the 1.3 million people who subscribe to her newsletter? Yeah. Um, I mean, how lucky are we to be the beneficiaries of all these things that her genius mind produces? Um, yeah, whether it's the videos, her newsletter, um, or her most recent book, Democracy Awakening, which hopefully you all saw is available for sale over there, yes? I mean, I imagine if you're super fans, you probably all have a copy. Um, but the copies we have are signed, so they're better than what you have. And, uh, you know, you could always buy a new one for yourself and then give your other copy to somebody else. Um, and all proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library, so you're doing a very good public service as well. Um, Heather recommended a number of books, uh, which you can find in your programs to follow up after tonight's conversation, um, including one by Andrew Del Banco, who is, of course, speaking with her tonight. And um, we are thrilled that Andrew is with us as well. He's a professor of American Studies at Columbia University, and has written books on everything from uh, Herman Melville to higher education uh, to his most recent book, which is Heather's recommendation, uh, The War Before the War. Um, Andrew's also recommended some books in your program, so you have a lot of reading to do after tonight. Um, and there will be a test. We have your email addresses. We're going to send them to you. And of course, all of their books are available uh, at the New York Public Library with your library card, which obviously you all have. I won't even ask. I just, how would you even come into this building if you don't have a library card? Um, so, as I said, this is the first live of 2024, but we have an amazing lineup this spring. I have to say I'm very excited about what we've got coming up. Um, next week, we have novelist Alvaro Enrique talking about his insane new book about Hernan Cortez and, weirdly, the band T-Rex, uh, You Dreamed of Empires. Later in the month, we have photographer Dawood Bay, um, as well as bassist extraordinaire Christian McBride. Further down the road, we have events coming up with Maggie Haberman, um, the accidental icon Lynn Slater, the great Marilyn Robinson, um, Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, classicist Emily Wilson, many, many more. Um, go to nypl.org slash live to sign up. Everything is free, so we hope to see you there. Um, and there's going to be a lot more coming up past that that we haven't announced, so I would encourage you while you're at our website to sign up for our newsletter, um, and then you'll find out about everything as we announce it. Um, okay, Heather and Andrew are going to come up in a second. Hopefully all of you saw that you have note cards on your seats. These are for asking questions. They would love to take some of your questions at the end, uh, write them down, and some of my colleagues will come by and collect them. If you're watching online, you can put your questions in the chat, um, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org. Uh, we'd love to hear from you wherever you are. Uh, so, again, thank you for being here, and without further ado, let's give it up for Andrew Del Banco and Heather Cox Richardson. <laughs> Was a Taylor Swift style ovation. Um, I'll take credit for 10% of it or so. Um, thank you all for being here. It's a real pleasure for me to um, have the opportunity to be in conversation with an historian I much admire. And we discovered a few days ago that we had a teacher in common that makes us makes me feel a little bit like this is a family occasion. Um, we haven't rehearsed very much. Uh, I do have a piece of paper in front of me, so I'll have a fighting chance to keep a train of thought going, at least in my own mind. Um, but I, I wanted to start by asking a kind of basic and maybe grandiose question, something like this. Um, 
everyone I know, and I suspect this is true for all of you, is anxious in the present, terrified about the future. <laughs> and so I wonder, why should we expect them to be interested in the past? So this is a great question, and I have ideas about it, but I want to start by um, telling you that the reason that I'm up here tonight with the great Andrew Del Banco is because when I had the opportunity to choose anybody I wanted to talk with me here, I said, is there any chance we can get Andy Del Banco? Because if you don't... If you don't know his work, and he's, see, I got the mic, so, and I'm not looking at him, so he can't shut me up. His work on um, early American and 19th century American literature is genius. And he is the man who understands it all and explains it all incredibly well. So I was actually kind of hoping to get to ask him questions, and they tell me we can't do that. But if you have not read his books, you should. And if you have not Googled Stephen Colbert, <laughs> Roller Coaster, Moby Dick, <laughs> do it the minute you get home. And I don't know how many times I've seen that video and I still cry it, 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 with hysteria every time I see it. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you, and, and we won't reveal the quid pro quo here as to, you know, <laughs> reward Heather for saying those nice things, but thank you very much. But to answer that question, I think the, to me, the answer is that what historians do is we study how and why societies change. And so we don't do what journalists do, which is to break the scoops, tell you what happened yesterday, and this happened, and this happened, this happened. We look at all those things, but we say, say these are the things that indicate a societal change in some way, part of that larger story. And because we're telling that larger story of how societies change, that means being able to reach back into the past and say, hey, here's a similar situation in the 1850s or the 1890s or the 1920s that looks a lot like where, where we are today. Not only makes people feel like I hear so many people say, well, it gives me comfort to know we've been here before, but it also gives us the sense that we are part part of a larger trajectory that is taking us somewhere, and crucially, that we have agency to determine where that somewhere is going to be. And I think that's why history in this moment, every time, if I read another story about how history is dying, you know, I actually went to respond to one of those on Twitter today with three laughing emojis, and I thought, no, that's just too mean, I can't do that. <laughs> I, think, I think history is more alive today than ever because we need to feel our feet under us. Okay. Can I respond with an anecdote? Is that okay? Of course. Even a personal anecdote. Um, so, despite my Italian sounding last name, my parents were Jews born in Germany and um, left under duress. Fortunately, they got out early enough, 1936, and spent the war years in London. And my mother was a rather bookish young woman who read a lot of books. And one of the books she read was called War and Peace by Tolstoy, which is kind of partly a novel and partly a history book. So, um, you know, the late 30s and very beginning of the 40s were a very dark time. And then she got up one morning and heard on the BBC that Hitler had invaded Russia. And she said to my father, now we can have a second child. And the second child, I believe, is sitting right in front of me here in the first <laughs> row. Now, what's the point of that story? Um, uh, that's a, an illustration, I guess, that one can learn something from history. That what happened to Napoleon in the invasion of Russia was very likely to happen to Hitler a hundred plus years later. Um, that's one reason, I think, to care about history, to try to see um, continuities, uh, truths that are not particular to one time and place, that, but persist. But no doubt there are other reasons. I mean, do we believe in the Santayana proposition that if you don't know history, you're condemned to repeat it? Do you believe that? No, I don't. But, but before we go on to, to that larger meaning, let me throw that back to you about why literature matters. Because I would argue that history is the fact-based study of how and why societies change, but literature distills that into human emotion which often is not in history, um, except unless you really dig for it. 
Okay, um, that's a tough question. Let me try to give you something like a soundbite answer. Um, people need stories. Uh, we're storytelling creatures, and we have an appetite for stories. Narrative is a way of connecting disparate phenomena and into a structure that feels coherent, and that can maybe helps to persuade us that, that decisions can lead to outcomes. So I think, and I'm speaking of a branch of literature now, this probably doesn't apply to lyric poetry, but to epic poetry, to prose fiction. So people need stories. I think that's one reason my students still have an appetite for literature. And another thing I would say, maybe this is peculiar to me, is that prose fiction in particular is about people in conflict with themselves. That is, the great novels that come to mind, Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, Scarlet Letter, these are stories about people who are struggling with two different dimensions of themselves and trying to figure out how to act in the world. And we're all like that, right? So I think, I think literature is close to the heart and we'll always need it. Uh, and I guess that's my best short answer to your question. Well, it's interesting because this doesn't answer what you just asked me, but of course, one of the things that I think is missing in American history nowadays and in American politics, and I'm trying to supply it, is that story. Yeah. And, and the meaning, I, the, I, would, I would go a step further than what um, Andy just said and suggest that it is, what distinguishes humans from other species is that we try and make sense of the passage of time. And the way we try to make sense of the passage of time, other animals do that, I know. D dog lovers always tell me they make sense of the passage of time through scent. Well, we don't really do that. But we do try to make sense of the passage of time to define ourselves and our nation by the stories we tell. So one of the things that I try and do, and I'm very consciously trying to do in this book, but I try and do it every night in the letters, is tell a story, a fact-based story, about who we are. Because I think one of the ways that the radical right has become as powerful as it is is by telling a story of the little guy who is at war with the empire, and in order to really fulfill his destiny, he has to destroy that large empire as in the federal government. And you know, that's epic. That's everything from the old stories that, that you know, are in our earliest texts, at least in the West, through Star Wars, with Luke Skywalker standing up against the empire with the help of that crazy little dude who whispers in his ear, right? He doesn't need an education. Because remember the first scene of with the two moons coming up in, in, uh, in Star Wars in 77 is because Luke Skywalker's uncle won't let him go get an education. So instead he just has this, wisp, this, this I don't know, whisper in his ear that enables him to yeah. overcome the empire. So, so let's talk a little bit about the story that you tell in this book. In my sense, it's getting all philosophical. Yeah, my, well, we can we can go back we can go back to the philosophical stuff in a minute. <laughs> but let's talk about your the story you tell. Um, my sense is that you are wanting to tell a progressive story. You begin with an account of the Weimar Republic and the collapse of democracy in Germany, and then you say America avoided that catastrophe. And you say something like, we avoided it, and correct me if I'm misrepresenting it, we avoided it because there was a deep public commitment to the fundamental principle of individual integrity and freedom. Equality before the law and a right to have a say in your government that right. is kept in front of us because of the struggles of marginalized Americans who did not have access to those things. Okay. So, and, and the New Deal, and Franklin Roosevelt in particular, emerge as heroic entities and forces in, in, in that story. Um, now, but then it starts to go wrong. I mean, it persists through the great society, through the L LBJ years, who was after all a, a young New Dealer when he first came to Washington. But then it starts to go wrong. And you talk in particular about the transformation or degradation of the opposition party, the Republican Party. And that becomes a sort of 
darker part of the narrative you're telling is the collapse of Republican principles, the surrender to demagoguery, um, the uh, exploitation of racism as a sentiment that animates people. So talk to us a little bit about how that progressive story and how that story of decline and degradation go together and where you think we are now. Okay, so the book was designed to be a series of short essays that answer the questions that everybody asks me all the time, such as how did the party switch sides? Um, what was the Southern strategy? You know, do we live in a democracy or a republic? Um, and what I realized pretty quickly was that the question that most people ask is, how did we get here? Where on earth are we? And how do we get out? And the, so that's why the book is designed as it is. But the overarching argument in three sections that answer those specific pieces, but the overarching argument says that the way democracies fall is through the use of language and false history. So that first section, which begins in 1937 with the publication of the what was known as the Conservative Manifesto, which pushed back against the New Deal's four pillars, saying that those were not, in fact, the things that government should do. The, the New Deal put in place a government that regulated business, provided a basic social safety net, promoted infrastructure, and protected civil rights, although it was I iffy in those days. But those were the four pillars on which that liberal consensus was, was going to stand. And that Conservative Manifesto in 37 said, Government had no role to regulate business because businessmen needed to be able to design their, their um, businesses however they wished and make as much money as they possibly could. It certainly had no business in a, protecting a social safety net because that belonged to the churches. It should not promote infrastructure because that should be private enterprise that does that. So the profits went back into the business community and they wanted nothing to do with civil rights. They wanted the idea of home rule, which was code for uh, for, for continued segregation. And the reason I started there is, doesn't that sound familiar? I mean, you can lift that literally into discussions at least up until 2016. I think we could make an argument about what happened after that. But the story of the narrative there was how those people who believed in this destruction of the liberal consensus that had been put in place with the New Deal and later by Eisenhower's Middle Way, they destroyed that not by making a fact-based argument, but instead by deliberately using language in such a way that it created good Americans and those others. And those others were people who wanted handouts that they didn't deserve, women, people of color, um, people who were otherwise marginalized out of that society. And that language, that, that pushing of a story that was never based in reality is what I was arguing destroyed that liberal consensus and ultimately managed to put in place a person who at that point took the rhetoric that he had been um, really, that had been primed to put him in front of an audience and in front of, uh, of the American political system and turned it into an authoritarian movement, which is actually slightly different than what I'm talking about. That's the middle section of the book. But the third section is the interesting one, and that's where I was sort of trying to say, in order to understand our history as a multicultural, multi-gendered, um, multi-class nation, you have to both incorporate those people that have previously been left out of our stories or are now being excluded again by the kind of authoritarian history that I think people like Donald Trump are pushing. I wanted to marry that with what I still consider to be the extraordinarily radical ideas of the American Revolution, that people should be treated equally before the law and have an equal right to have a say in their government, which is was in 1776 radical and is still extraordinarily radical. And so the story I was trying to tell is that in order for those ideas to be real, we need to reclaim the history of those marginalized people who, for, the, for all the fact they were excluded from that conception in 1776, took it to heart and have held it up ever since. And because of them, we have managed to be able to expand our liberal democracy and with luck can do it again. So, so I think um, that what you've said, I think, connects to my proposition that people need stories. Yes. We need a national story in which we can have some degree of consensus so that we can believe we're part of a progressive project. But let me, let me be a little 
devil advocate-ish for a moment, because the risk of this event is that we're going to agree on almost everything, um, which is maybe less interesting than if we disagreed. Um, right now, as you're well aware, uh, how to tell the story of American history is hotly contested uh, terrain. So I'm very sympathetic to the way you tell the story of the New Deal. Franklin Roosevelt is a great hero of mine. Forgive me for being personal again, but that second brother I mentioned, his middle name is Franklin because my mother wanted to name him for this heroic figure who came to the rescue of Britain and, and civilization. But right now, we have a lot of revisionist history about the New Deal, which stresses that which stresses the, the bargain that Roosevelt struck with the Southern Democrats, the fact that black Americans were overwhelmingly excluded from Social Security because they were agricultural workers in the South and they made a carve out for them. Domestic workers too. Uh, domestic workers too, right. Um, that the GI Bill, which we rightly celebrate as creating opportunity for young men mostly, but also some young women who had never had an opportunity for advanced education, also excluded almost all black Americans because the institutions wouldn't let them in, the private and public mm -hmm. institutions. So that there, there's an argument afoot that the, the so-called progressive New Deal was only able to take hold and move forward because it, it excluded black people. And there's an argument, as you know, that it's wrong to begin the American story in 1776. We really need to begin it in 1619. And although there are some, I think, dubious claims that the revolution was fought to defend slavery, which I think is totally wrong, it's certainly true that the revolution was fought on behalf of a society that was still a slave society. So what do you, what do, you do with the... I mean, I think this is a healthy situation that we're arguing about our story, but we don't really seem to have one right now. We have an argument, and people are more sh shouting at each other than listening to each other in this regard. Thoughts? Yes. So I have very, I have a lot of thoughts about that. You'll be shocked to hear. Um, <laughs> yeah. A couple of things, of course, they have walked back that argument from the 1619 project that the American Revolution was yeah. fought. Uh, about slavery, and, and I have issues with the 1619 project, in part because I think that you that it excludes the idea of indigenous slavery, and indigenous slavery took place the second that a uh, European ship anchored off of the South American continent, let alone the North American continent. So I think that the my my take on these things is very different, in part because I, my work tends to emphasize class as much as race, which is not always the case with some some of the people who write for the 1619 Project, which I think was a very good corrective to where the country was in that moment. But yes, we need a national story, and yes, everything that you have said is true. Um, the, what, what I think we need to do, though, is not throw, I hate to be incredibly original, but the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Because the ideas behind the American Revolution remain, as I say, I think noble ideas, they are ones that people have been willing to give up their lives for and are still willing to give up their lives for. And the fact that we have never achieved them is not a mark of the, their lack, but our lack. And one of the things that I liked about the way that I finally wrote that third section was that by recognizing that democracy is a struggle, that people do get excluded from that until they find ways to make their voices heard, that it reinforces the idea of struggle as being at the center of democracy rather than being excluded from it. So if you read the 1776 Project, which you can still find online, although only on the Wayback Machine last I checked, because it's been removed from all the official websites, it's really interesting. It reads very much like a late 19th century version of American history written by former Confederates, because there was never anything wrong with America. Um, the in, enslavement was really quite mild, if it ever existed, in, you know, in any systematic, harsh way. There were only a few people who were harsh. There was never really any racial problem at all. There were a few bad apples, but most Americans were 100% behind the idea of racial equality forever in our history. I mean, it's a, this wonderful fantasy that 
does two things that I think are really important. One is that, to my mind, it reinforces the rise of authoritarianism by saying, there was a perfect past, and we can get back to that perfect past if only we have the right guy in charge who's not going to be tripped up by all these terrible people in our present who are insisting on things like the law. And, and so we need to, if we can get back to that, if we can just clear the way of those sorts of people. So I think that serves authoritarianism by focusing on the idea that we were ever perfect. And, you know, one of my professors in college used to talk about how um, from the very beginning of the Puritans arriving in the United States, they were already talking about how they had screwed things up. There was never anything perfect. I'm joking because we had the same advisor. Right. Um, who was the one who, and then he went on to write a number of great books with him. I did not. Um, um, but it does that. But the other thing that, that that perfect past does, and sometimes the other contested past that you talk about does as well, is it erases agency. And if I wanted to identify one thing that's missing in our country, or was in 2015, it's the idea that democracy belongs to us and we can change the direction of the country. So one of the things, again, that, that my version of history is designed to do is to say, yeah, you know, we've got an entire past in which huge numbers of Americans, sometimes the vast majority of Americans, were marginalized. They weren't treated equally before the law. They didn't have a right to a say in their government. So how did we end up where we are today? And I got to tell you, cynical though it sounds, I don't think there is ever a time when people expand rights based solely on the idea that it would be a really nice thing to do for people. No. So if that's the case, why has power been broken and expanded throughout our history? And the answer to that has to come from the majority who were excluded. And that's that's, I think, a broader story and a story we need right now. That's, that's, that's a great, and, and that's why you're so passionately angry in this book about the efforts to restrict voting rights. And, and passionately angry in the present. Right. I mean, this worries me off the charts. Right. And, and honestly, we keep talking about the 14th Amendment and the many different aspects about the 14th, which is my favorite amendment. I know you all have your own favorites. Um, <laughs> But I'm wondering. Do you wondering, like the part about you can't be president if you led an insurrection? You like I like that part. That part. I, I'm really keen on uh, due process of the laws and equal protection of the laws. That's the, I like that a lot because, of course, in 68, that was 1868, that was designed to make sure that states couldn't discriminate against anybody within their borders. But you know what I really like these days? That you lose representation in Congress if you disfranchise significant members, significant bodies of your population. And that has never been used before, and it's never been used before because in the 19th century they brought it up every census time, but every time they brought it up, uh, it turned out that the North was disfranchising more people than the South was. Right. Um, so not over racial issues, usually they were over class issues because remember you've got lots of immigration in the late 19th century, especially in the cities like, I don't know, I can't think of one. Where are you? Know. Um, <laughs> But, um, but I don't think that, that's, that that would be the issue any longer. I think it's Democratic-dominated versus Republican-dominated yeah. states, and I don't know why anybody's not talking about that. Oh, look, someone is. Uh, yeah, one, one thing, if you study a lot of American history, you want to go a little easy on the idea that the North was the good guys and the South was the bad guys at all critical junctures. I mean, one comment, and then I think we ought to get to the present because this crowd will be, feel cheated if we don't talk about a certain, a certain presidential candidate at, at least a little bit. Um, again, to connect to the comment I was making about literature and how they might have some affinity with history. Another way, I think, of putting the issue that Heather has put in front of us is people are complicated. So, you know, you've got to be able to wrap your mind around the fact that Thomas Jefferson was a great Democrat and a slave owner. And I find that this is really hard for my students. They want, I'm generalizing unfairly here, but people want uh, a clear demarcation line between good and evil. And my impression is that life doesn't work that way. When Mr. Lincoln spoke about the better angels of our nature, that great phrase from the first inaugural, the implication of that is that we have demons within us as well. And the struggle is to listen to the better angels. We all are engaged in that struggle, and our country has been engaged in that struggle. 
This applies to literary studies. I mean, you know, a great writer like Edith Wharton was an anti-Semite. How do you put those two things together is something that people need to be able to think about. But I'm going to push back on that okay. because I think that is what many people would say, that people want good or bad. And I hear this people, when I talk about the, the founders, for example, people say, well, if you talk about that, people only want to hear all, you know, a happy, rosy story. And, and my understanding of that is different that people want to hear about what you were talking about with literature, internal struggles and the triumph of justice or good at the end of the day. I mean, it's no fun to watch a movie where somebody is going to win from the beginning, right? You want to see something that is a struggle. And one of the things that I think is so powerful in this moment is recognizing that our heroes do not have to be, you know, Superman. They can be somebody who just got up and put one foot in front of the other and just did the right thing because she chose not to do the wrong thing. And at the end of the day, she ended up changing American society. Because that's really the human story, that's the personal story. I think it's also the national story, and it's a mistake to look at, I mean, I have a thing about Thomas Jefferson, but it's a mistake to look at any of our so-called heroes and see them as anything other than human beings right. who, have, who have just done the right thing. I mean, a great example of this to my mind is, um, you know, you probably know who Mike Fanone is. He was one of the um, Capitol Police officers who went into work that day on January 6th because he, he saw what was happening and he showed up and he was almost killed. He, had, he ended up having cardiac arrest because he was tased so often. And he's just a regular guy. You know, he's just a regular guy. And, you know, he was talking about all these people who won't do the right thing and all that. And, and I said to him once in a, in a crowd and like this, you know, why did you do it? And he said, well, what else could I do? And I said, and that's why you're a hero. And I said, would you do it again? And he goes, absolutely. That's a hero, you know? Yeah. So I... What, what I hear you saying and what I think is so evident in your book. We need an honest history. We need a history that has the heroes and the villains and more particularly that shows that oftentimes that was the same person. Yeah. So I'm looking at the clock here. We want to leave time for questions. So I got to ask you this now and I'll do it with another anecdote if I may. Um, I spent a fair amount of time driving up the Taconic Parkway north of the city because I have a little writing retreat upstate and for most of my life, there was a sign, there still is a sign saying Franklin Delano Roosevelt State Park, just parallel to Hyde Park, which is a few miles to the west. And about X number of years ago, another sign appeared maybe 10 miles south, <laughs> right? My wife, my wife tells me she, every time she looks up from the car, she sees that sign and we have to, we have to stop for a break. Um, it says, Donald J. Trump State Park, within 10 miles of each other. So my question is an unfair question. Uh, <laughs> talk to us about how we got from FDR to Donald Trump. Well, but, but, but there I think, right. but, but I think the answer, to, uh, my answer to that is story. The idea, and I think this speaks to uh, something you and I have talked about before, is what changes history? What, 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 what can we do? What are the forces in history or the forces in human society that change the future? And my answer to that is always the stories, the language that we use. And so if you look at what happened with FDR and first with the New Deal and then with World War II is the United States very deliberately told an inclusive story. Not entirely inclusive, but think of the difference between Superman and that famous poster saying, your kids, if anybody tries to discriminate based on religion, you tell them that's un-American and they're not welcome here, versus where we ended up in the present, for example. Um, I think what happened was that, I think what happened was that both of the major parties, not just the Democrats, but both of the major parties beginning in 1960 ceased to tell stories because they believed that everybody believed so strongly in democracy and in the liberal consensus that there was no point in continuing to talk about it. And we have a very famous article from 1960 in which a political scientist said, stop trying to tell people stories about democracy, they get it. 
Tell them how you're going to build coalitions. But what that did is it enabled those movement conservatives who wanted to tear down that liberal consensus to write their own story about the little guy who was taking on this behemoth government that was destroying him. And they were going to be, in, and the, in the little guy, the individual, could tear that apart. And that's a really, really powerful story. And that story, the idea that there's good Americans and they're the ones that, that really are the salt of the earth and they're the ones the government should support, and then there are those others, became the, the, agents, the agent through which first Ronald Reagan rose. But of course, by 1986, even the Reaganites were recognizing that they did not have, have command of the majority. People didn't like supply side economics. So as early as 86, they start to suppress the vote. And they really begin to ramp up their appeals to evangelical white voters who are um, embracing traditional, what they call traditional values and the racism and sexism that went along with that. And that story then becomes more and more on steroids going forward as the, the economic programs of the Reagan people uh, become less and less popular. So we end up with where we were in 2016 when there was a candidate running for president who talked about th that particular candidate kept mixing together Mexicans and people from the Middle East. I never did quite untangle those things. But the Mexicans were rapists and criminals, although apparently there were some good people. But as soon as he was elected and put in office, he put in place what was known as a travel ban, which basically said majority Muslim countries couldn't send people to the United States. That was that story on steroids. And if you had taken that story from 2016, 2017, back to 1947, 1957, 1967, it certainly had threads back there, but it was so extreme, it was a caricature. But it had gotten to an extreme place where it sold because people had been looking at that, letter, that language for about 40 years at that point. And this is one of the things that scholars of authoritarianism tell you is that you need to have a time period through which a population is softened, if you will, to accept this extremism, to accept the idea of their opponents being non-human, being very different, in order to, to adhere to a strong man. And that's how we then got this flip into whatever that candidate's name yeah. was. So I'm going to, right, I'm going to push back for a bit, and maybe oddly, because I'm the literary guy, and I started the whole story thing that's going on here. <laughs> and I think, um, obviously, story is important. But I think intellectuals uh, missed the boat on this badly. Nobody saw in what particular way. Well, nobody, <laughs> nobody, nobody saw Trump coming. Oh, I totally right? disagree with you. You do. Okay. Well, oh let my me God. let me finish Read my thought. Read every one of my books from 1997 forward. Say, say again. Every one of my books from 1997 forward. Stop it, guys. This is a bad idea. Don't do this, guys. Really bad idea. Okay. Well, I look, stand corrected. Here's All intellectuals, with idea. the exception of Heather. No, 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 um, no, no. <laughs> Okay. Political historians got okay. this. I mean, to some degree, we dropped the ball by not studying political history as much as we should have, but political historians were all over this. Okay, but the underlying question, whether we, they saw it or didn't see it, is why did this happen? And I, I would propose that there were a, a lot of people in this country, we call them now the base or the MAGA movement, um, a lot of people in this country who thought that the stories that both political parties were telling were fairy tales or bullshit. That the old Republican uh, notion of, you know, free trade and, and uh, supply side economics wasn't working for them. And the, and the neo New Deal side of the Democratic Party wasn't working for them. The forces of globalism were hollowing out the industrial center of this country. Um, people were feeling that they couldn't maintain a quality of life as high as their as their parents had been able to maintain. Then we had the opioid epidemic, which came in and destroyed untold numbers of lives. And this kept going, right? The 2008 financial crisis, the bankers didn't go to jail, but the mortgage holders got, got screwed. Um, those people felt like the story had nothing to do with them. Oh, I disagree. Okay. Because I think we're saying the same thing, that 40 years of the program that the, the, the 
Republican Party put in place, and the Democrats as well in certain ways, that's kind of an interesting story, hollowed out the middle class. We know that. Every statistic shows that money just went up to the very top. But how do you make sense of that? You know, what you, I think what you're making, the distinction you're making is whether the, the rise of somebody like Trump was economic or was, was race-based. And I think in 2016, you can argue it was economic. How about both? And both for sure. But I think in 16, if you, most people forget that in 16, Trump was the most economically moderate Republican on that stage. He called for better and, and cheaper health care. He called for getting rid of the tax loopholes. He called for bringing back manufacturing. He called for infrastructure, which is right. why we kept hearing about the infrastructure. Uh, bill. Absolutely right. Yeah. That that all disappeared by by the time of the August unite the right unite the right rally in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, but. But still, how do you make sense of that? They didn't make sense of that by saying, hey, we need different laws. They made sense of that by falling into that language of, I'm a good American, and the reason that I don't have any money is not because of the laws that those people have put in power. The reason I don't have any money or I don't have jobs or whatever, it's because those people took my jobs from me. Right. And that, that make, the way you make sense of the world I think, you know, you know, my thing is, and this makes sense considering where, you know, where I came from um, in, in scholarship, is that sometimes the way people think the world is, is much more important than the way the world actually is. And what I feel like we have seen, at least since the 1980s, but, but you know, People, psychology is, is uh, people's psychology can always be manipulated, is this increasing divorce between reality and image. And we now have a major political party that is quite literally running exclusively on the idea of creating a false reality. And this has become a political, um, a way to manipulate politics. Really, it was articulated in out of Russia with the idea of political technology or virtual politics, the idea that you can create a false reality, especially through social media, that people will then act on. Um, that, I think, we're seeing play out. But I will say, one of the things that I'm fascinated by in the present as in like today, is that many of us have studied how one manipulates a society in order to let a strong man rise. And this is not new to our generation at all. But we're only starting now to look at what happens when a population recognizes that it has been manipulated and tries to take its society back. And one of the things that the very few people looking at that say is that people learn to use the same techniques that were used against them in order to protect themselves. And so when I am looking at uh, this theoretical um, convoy that's supposed to be going down to the Texas border, and last I checked it was 19 trucks and no semis, that matters. You know, that's really different than where we were two or three years ago, where a convoy, first of all, tr shut down a couple of borders, both the Mexican border and then the Canadian border, and then they had a second one and it got lost and just kept driving, I'm sorry. It did. It just kept driving around Washington, D.C. But now we got this third one, and people are like, eh, I've, you're not going to fool me again. And so I wonder where we are with that changing story, with all the people who are starting to recognize that they have been duped. It seems to me we see people who are apathetic. You're all crooks. I'm backing away. You get people who are true converts because they're pissed off that they got tricked, and those are the never-Trumpers I think you're seeing out there. And then there's the group that I think is so angry at being tricked, they just want to burn it all down, and they don't care who gets hurt in the process. Well, I'm hearing some optimism in what you just said, <laughs> which... Uh, and we'll see, whether, we'll see whether there's any optimism in these cards, but I just want to... I just want to observe, and I think this is implicit in what you're saying, the constituency of the Republican Party has changed, right, in my lifetime. Yeah. And one of the things, and you're probably writing about it this week if you haven't already, um, there are some southern legislatures that are talking about expanding Medicaid because Republican voters in those states belong to the constituency that will benefit from Medicaid. And just yesterday, I don't know that it'll go anywhere, but just yesterday, a bipartisan tax bill came out of the House of all places that included a, an expansion of the child care tax credit. 
It's in tonight's letter. So it's interesting times. It's interesting times, and... Um, well, this is why yeah. I keep saying that Biden is such a transformative president. One of the reasons is because what he has done is he has refuted the economic policies that we have been operating under since 1981, and he has shown that they work. And all of a sudden, you've got this problem of a number of Republicans who want to be reelected. Now, there are some who are in such safe districts that it doesn't matter what happens. But the ones who want to be reelected are suddenly sort of sitting up and going, we have to do things that support the idea of a government that works for ordinary Americans. And there's these funny splits where, and, and not funny, laughable, but odd splits where you know the things that the Democrats are trying to push right now, common, uh, common sense gun safety laws, for example, that's popular with more than 80% of the American population. Like, these are not fringe beliefs. And then you had yesterday in the, uh, one of the legislatures, uh, uh, a state legislator who flashed his loaded gun to a bunch of students who were there to protest gun safety legislation. That's not a good move if you're hoping to be reelected by those people. Um, but you're seeing this funny thing, like you say, where you've got both those people who are like, let's just shut down the government. We don't want it to do anything. We're just going to impeach a bunch of, you know, the president and the homeland secretary, and we're not going to let anything through the House of Representatives. And then you also have a number of Republicans who are starting to be like, you know, we'd kind of like to keep hanging out in Washington, and we're not going to be able to do that if we don't at least, I don't know, pass an appropriations bill. And it's all kind of playing out right now over aid to Ukraine, over uh, possibly over the border measure, although since nobody's seen it, it's a little hard to tell. But you can see these fractures where the party is no longer able to say, we're not going to try the FDR way because it doesn't work, because Biden has proved it worked. And the numbers uh, coming out yesterday from the International Monetary Fund were extraordinary. And that's, um, you know, it's going to be hard to push back against that. And you can see all the attempts to say, you know, don't look over there, look over here. Let's, let's hope that you, we, you used the term uh, social media a few minutes ago. Yet the other thing that happened yesterday was Mr. Zuckerberg turning around and making that lame apology to families who had lost children. It, I, I, I want to agree with you, and a large part of me does, but there is a problem, which is that people don't live in the actual world. They live in the social media fantasy world. And so the reality of what President Biden has been doing is not penetrating to a lot of people. So that's, but that's another. Now, oddly enough, all these questions are for Heather. I know, um, but I'll read them anyway. Um, well, well, I actually so, have one for Andy, if we have oh, time for it. Uh, okay, can we get yeah, to some of these? Yeah, we can start with that. So um, how do you, as an academic historian, make scholarship accessible to the public. In other words, how do you distill information so that it resonates with people who might not care about the past? Okay, so I love this question. It's like the first time I've ever gotten this question. People always ask me, how do I decide what to write about? And I think I've made that clear. I wanna write about the things that look to me like if I were writing a book in 150 years, I would put them in it because they have changed something. And my example of that is I never bothered to write about the Republican primary debates because what, were the, what difference were they going to make? I mean, I could watch just as happily watch paint dry, right? Um, but the night of one of those, um, the UAW president, Sean Fain, cut a one-minute video, I think it was, might have been 30 seconds, with President Biden in which they praised each other. I covered that because that suggested that the unions were going to line up behind Biden in 2024. So that's how I choose what I'm going to write about. But there's a really easy way that I make the stuff that I write accessible, I think. And that's that you all think I know this stuff. And actually, in history, I'm pretty good. You know, I know that stuff. But like, I don't know who these people are. I don't like, I have to look up the freaking G7 and G20 every single time. <laughs> every single time. So I write it until I understand it and really understand it, not like, like I say things and then I just sort of pretend like I know it. I actually need to understand it myself. And once I understand it, I feel, and, and think it's cool, I figure other people will probably like it too. And my, again, a great example of that, and one of the ways I got into this is, I don't know if you remember, but 
when, when Tom Cotton, who's a senator from Arkansas, first took, very young, first, first took office, very young senator, first took office, he wrote this letter to Iran saying, you know, basically don't make a deal with, uh, with um, Obama because we'll change it. And the, all these newspaper stories were like, well, he's broken the Logan Act. And I'm like, I have taught American history for 30 freaking years, and I don't know what the Logan Act is. How are we all supposed to know what the Logan Act is? So I looked it up. The Logan Act is actually very simple. It's some guy during the, uh, you know, when they were trying to get Jefferson in office, goes to France and says, if you help Jefferson get elected, you know, we'll, we'll change our policies so it's nice to France. I'm like, why didn't you just tell me that? So I didn't have to go look it up. That's what I do. I make sure that every time I mention anything, including, you notice, he's never just President Biden or the president the first time. He is always introduced as President Joe Biden because I figure people are tired, they're doing the laundry, they're, you know, thinking about other stuff. They don't need, think, they should not have to worry about what the G7 is. Um, so I think that's the answer is that, um, that I, I feel like, and I'm never afraid to ask a stupid question because there is no such thing as a stupid question. And I spend a lot of time going, wait, I don't quite understand that. And you'd be shocked how many times lots of people don't really understand it either, but they don't dare to ask. So that's how, that's, if, it, if I explain things well, that's why. Now, here's a reality check question. Um, wasn't one of the reasons people supported Trump because of eight years of a black president? Oh, yeah. But, but it wasn't just, I mean, th there's so many layers to that um, because, of course, remember the th one of the things that people really identify as starting the, the, the radical poll, poll that became the Trump base is the Tea Party movement. And the Tea Party movement, we know, was astroturfed, and it was astroturfed in large part by, um, by very wealthy industrialists who were terrified of the idea of having, having a, dem a Democrat in office because he was going to regulate business and raise taxes. And so the, what we've seen, really, since the 1980s is this marriage of the no tax or low tax, uh, no business regulation group of very wealthy Americans who've done very, very well under the tax cuts that began with Reagan, and certainly under the tax cuts under George W. Bush and now the Trump tax cuts, which were extraordinary for people of wealth and for corporations. And they knew they didn't have the votes. As early as the 1980s, they knew they didn't have the votes, so they created this marriage with this base that was a sexist and racist base, but they never really intended for them to take power. And what we have seen really since 2021, after Biden took office, is the degree to which Trump cemented himself and that base in power largely in the states by taking over the state parties, um, which is if you look at Arizona, for example, or the Michigan State Party or the Florida State Party, you can see that they're, they're Trump controlled. And that, that base now, the base that wants those stories and wants to feel better than, than marginalized Americans. And, and we talk a lot about the, the race card here or the race issue here, which is very visible and very, um, and, and very salient. One of the things I think we downplay is the misogyny. There is a lot of misogyny going way back here, not least through the Southern Baptist Convention which you know, reorganizes in the late 1970s because they don't want women taking positions of power in the church, when that, of course, was a huge denomination. It's fallen way back now because of its, its scandals, its sex scandals, among other things. Um, so yes, that's absolutely true. But there's layer upon layer upon layer with that. And I think it's maybe a mistake to just pull one thing out. And it's more powerful to say it's not just about Obama, just about race, just about gender. It's all of those things. Because at the end of the day, what we are really looking at is a struggle over power and over control of the, most, the strongest, biggest, and most valuable country on Earth and whether that is going to be run by a very few people who think that they have the right and the, maybe the duty to rule the rest of us, or whether in fact we're going to reclaim the concept of democracy and the idea that this huge, valuable country belongs to all of us and we all should have equal rights within it. Yeah, it, 
you got a political career in mind? By any chance, you know, right? it's so funny. I, yeah. Everyone always tells me I should run for office. I would do nothing but have people come in and tell me cool stuff. <laughs> like, I just said to someone the other day, you want to see somebody get impeached for not breaking a law? I'd be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, foreign affairs. What really happened in the 1920 Wall Street bombing, you know? You must have some paperwork on that. You know? <laughs> We've been, it just occurs to me in response to the last thing you said, we've been using words like conservative, you talk about movement conservatives and liberals. One word we haven't used, I think, is reactionary. And I think that's kind of an important word to inject into the discussion in, in the root sense of what it means, right? People who are reacting to a change that they're finding hard to abide. So your point that there's misogyny alongside racism, I think is exactly right. And why? Because the opportunities for black people and the opportunities for women, as far as we have to go, have improved in the last half century markedly. Their role in the culture has changed. And that's very hard for a lot of people to accept. And I think it's a through, it's a through line in your book from Nixon's Southern Strategy to Lee Atwater and the notorious Willie Horton ad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to Donald Trump with a certain infernal intelligence picking up on the birther idea and running with that straight to the nomination of the Republican Party. That's a sobering story and I think it's one we should, we should keep in mind. Yes, but in terms of the concept, I've never used the word conservative talking about these people because they're not conservatives, they're radicals. Okay. They're, they're so, and, and one of the things about reactionaries is reactionaries are always on the right. And one of the things that I would like to emphasize when we talk about all the things you're talking about is this is a through line in American history. It's not, yeah. it's not, they're not really reacting to anything. That's like people telling you that the backlash, that there was a backlash against Roe v. Wade. Well, they did, a, they did it really quick because the backlash against Roe v. Wade started in 1970 and Roe v. Wade was 1973. You know, they, that it was a front lash, if you will, because of the recognition that this would be a politically salient point to talk about how, and the, the early back, backlash, front lash against Roe v. Wade was not about fetuses, it was about women working outside the home. Right. Um, so that, but you can take that all the way back to, you know, as I say, before the, right. when, you know, that strand of American history that argues that some people are better than others and have a right to rule is just as old or older. It's actually older in our history than the idea that we should all be equal before the law and have a right to a say in it. So it's less a reaction than this through line that we can always keep grabbing for. So, so on that point, I think somebody's going to tell us we got to wrap it up sh shortly, but um, some of the issues you've been mentioning, one puzzlement I have, and maybe you can help me with it, it's my impression that on a number of these hot button issues, including abortion, gun control, health care. Taxes on the rich. Taxes on the rich. There's actually a pretty broad consensus in this country yes, there on is. most of these issues. There is. There so is. We're very, the deal, very much less so, divided than people think so we are. So what's the deal with the polarized politics when we have a public that is prepared to agree on reasonable positions on all of those issues. You don't get elected these days if you talk about being reasonable. Right, but, th but that, that's a good answer, but there's a prior question, why not? Well, again, because I think, that, I think language has been weaponized to say that, that you must turn out, we know that, the, that the, the Republican base especially turns out in huge numbers, and those are the people that put in place in the state legislatures, the people who would gerrymander their states so that they kept getting more and more and more extreme. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting, as I say, with the recognition that it is possible for the government to do good stuff, which is finally getting some, some traction in the, in, in the newspapers, for example, and as people are seeing things like their roads and their bridges getting fixed and the expansion of the 
the um, of healthcare and the, uh, the 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 bringing back of manufacturing and the the many ways in which the last three years have painted a very different picture of what government actually does in this country. It would be very interesting to see what happens in this 2024 election because you, know, you watch somebody like Sean Fain, the president of the UAW, coming out and saying, listen, we're rebuilding the country. We're in this together. We're, you know, we're, we're doing this as a, as a group of people who want to work together. We're not dividing ourselves any longer. And it'll be interesting to see if that language ca carries on. Yeah. All this government is the problem, not the solution stuff, which we've heard from both parties different times. Mike, have you ever met a Republican who doesn't cash their social security check? <laughs> I haven't. Nick, the, Nikki Haley's all over this, by the way. Yeah. You know. So um, I think it's time for us to wrap this up. It's what obvious. What makes you say that? <laughs> yeah, it says that right on that monitor there, right? Um, <laughs> As you can probably tell, I could sit here all night and talk to Heather. I'm sure you'd like to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to hold you for, for one more minute because I want to say something, and that is that I want to thank you all uh, for being in this moment. Uh, for participating as you are in American democracy. But for me personally, I cannot tell you what it means for a historian to be able to keep the record of this country in this moment. And yeah, it's a lot of late nights, and my poor husband um, is here tonight, and he doesn't see me nearly as much as I think he might like to. Uh, so there are sacrifices that have been involved, but let me tell you, there is never a day when I don't feel like the luckiest woman on earth, and I recognize that I'm here because of you all because of the questions you ask, the criticisms you make, the issues you want to know more about, and I really thank you for enabling me to do what, what I do, and with luck for being able to turn this country around. I am looking forward to the next 10 months. I'm looking forward to doing it together, and I'm so pleased and proud to be part of this community. So thank you all so much for everything that you do for me and for this country.